Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, this is, I wonder what, does someone know what number CTO challenge this is? Any idea? I don't know, but it's, it feels like we're getting to like 10 somewhere, somewhere around there. <laughs> All right. Um, and uh, what we'll do, as we always do, is we'll uh, rehearse the challenge so that everybody who's here understands and we all agree what the, the problem was, problem set was. Uh, we'll uh, hear a presentation by the team, the report out, and then uh, the grim judging happens. So um, we have three judges, uh, one of which is, for the first time ever, because of the nature of this, is a participant uh, also, and so he will vote last. Uh, he's, he's playing both parts because it's his darn company, and he has to live with the results. So um, uh, I think that's about all we need to know. Uh, this is about human beings, uh, and can we actually get to the point where we can somehow communicate with other species. Um, so let's, uh, Khan, if you would lead us off, repeat the uh, challenge for the entire team and the three sub-challenges for each group. All right. Sure. So the company's name is Zulingua, and the company is developing a translator for animal language so that we would know what animals are trying to communicate with us. And we are concentrating at the moment with dogs using the power of AI technology. The charge to the panel was to come up with a complete roadmap for developing Zoolingua as a business, which means developing the company vision, developing the uh, organizational structure of the company, developing the investment strategies of the company, uh, the legal strategies that the company has to have, develop the marketing strategies for marketing the products that Zoolingua makes, and also developing the technology that needs to go into producing these products so that they can be marketed, so that people can then understand animal languages. So that is the charge to the panel. The overall challenge, yeah. And then the subcharges? The subcharges are uh, for the um, organizational structure and the investment uh, to come up with the organizational structure of this the company. Group. Yep. Uh, and the investment strategies, the subcharge to the marketing company or marketing part is to come up with the marketing strategies for marketing the products and the subcharge to the uh, technology subgroup is to come up with the technology that we're going to need to be able to uh, design this device so that this device will allow animals to communicate with us. Perfect. And um, are you the, you're sitting right there. <laughs> are you the, the only chair left. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How are you structuring your report out? Is, is it, are there three teams reporting out? Right. And is there a single point of contact here for who we want to call it? Are you the single yes, point of contact? Mark, Mark is starting first. Okay. So are you, shall I turn to you first? You, you right. shall. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, sure. and thank you, Con. Uh, the team introduced themselves the other day, so I don't think we need to do that now, and individuals will introduce right. themselves in, in due course. So yes, it was split up into three groups, so I'll, I'll be speaking in terms of the introduction and the business and the organization and then pass the ball uh, for the technology and then for the marketing. There'll be some room for some questions and obviously critical questions. And here to, to really serve Con and, and, and do our best in a, in a few days. Uh, There'll be some things in the plan that I'm going to describe are going to be um, not defined specifically because uh, it's just impossible to. But what one can do is at least create sort of profiles of pieces within a company that would be very important for a company such as this, and I'll speak to that in a, in a few moments. But what this really reminds me of is, a, is, a, is quite a famous saying uh, where one said, uh, everyone was mourning the death of the caterpillar until they realized it was turning into a butterfly. And I think that's what this process hopefully will, will, will create or bring about. Uh, in terms of uh, putting everybody in the right sort of mindset, I have about 15 minutes to speak here, so I'll make some general comments and speak, speak specifically about some of the, the items I referred to a moment ago. But I want everybody to sort of just get into the sort of the right mindset to sort of understand not just this problem, but the setting for the problem, uh, which is very much people-oriented. And I want you to imagine being born in Shanghai. 
And I want you to imagine being born to Russian parents. Imagine the languages, imagine the culture. And then imagine moving from there to the US. Imagine enrolling in school and not knowing the language and being placed in a classroom with stutterers because you don't know the language and it has nothing to do with stuttering. And you're in that classroom and you're not able to get out and your parents are doing everything they can to get you out because it's ridiculous and eventually some politicians have to connect to school boards to get you out of that classroom. Now what sort of experience would that give a person? I think tremendous empathy in terms of trying to understand other people. I think also tremendous sensitivity to being misjudged. And I think many people are misjudged in life and, and that can act as a catalyst to, to create some great things. What I was speaking about was Khan's life. And it's from that that this sensitivity and this empathy um, has come about and has dedicated um, 40 years to understanding the prairie dogs. Extraordinary. And I don't know if people in here have, have learned another language. I'm Canadian. There's friction between the French and the Americans. Um, there was friction between myself and the French until I learned the language. And then I understood the people very, very well. And I love them. In fact, my wife is French. So the opportunity to communicate creates an understanding um, that is very unique. And Kahn did that with the prairie dogs with a view of expanding that hopefully to all animals to create that baseline empathy, which really is part of the human experience and people are losing sight of. So then along comes Mark with new technology and puts it in a little glass and says, I think I can act as a catalyst here and perhaps maybe catapult this and take what um, Kahn has done in 40 years with prairie dogs and accelerate that potentially into a much, much less time relative to one animal and then be able to transfer that same understanding, that same uh, application or knowledge, if you like, to all animals. And imagine a world where we understood animals. Imagine that. We heard this morning about the whales. There's so much that we're learning. So that is the vision. The vision is to develop a technology, develop a technology to be able to understand animals and have them understand us. And with the benefit, basically, to the world and create a much, much happier place to, to be. Now, in terms of the, the uh, next piece, what I would like to do, if, if I can, is maybe just, if we can go through the, is this the slide? Yeah. Is that the clicker? OK, so there's our, there's our company vision. In this case, it could be a vision, it could be a mission. I, th I think it feels more like a mission than a vision, but uh, there's our company vision, which I just described. The opportunity statement here is really to change the world, to change how people interact, to change the, our relationship with nature. As young kids, we learn when we read books, there's man versus man, man versus himself, and man versus nature. Isn't it interesting? They don't have those themes in Asian um, literature. In, 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 in schools. Um, why are we against nature? Uh, it's crazy. So we should be working with nature. And so th the opportunity here is to create this for that ripple effect and, and the potential benefit could be enormous. And, and that's obviously the, 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 the opportunity here. In terms of our values, it's very important if you're gonna create a technology to do all these wonderful things that the company itself be it and be empathetic and everybody within the company. And so we decided amongst ourselves that yes, this company has to be a business and it has to be profit oriented, but a good chunk of it's gonna be dedicated to animal causes. And that'll separate us from a lot of people. Um, there in all likelihood is if once this starts, I was part of a fire starter a few years ago, Gary Roshak in the crowd was as well. We were the first to market, or first to announce a product within a few months. Uh, we had about a dozen competitors. And no doubt something like this might happen. Perina, no doubt, was, is gonna try and find a few people. And what could they do? They build a little app. 
and they say, listen, you buy a, a bag of uh, dog food for $50 or $20, we're going to give you the free app. You use it 10 times, and you're going to get a discount on the, on the dog food. So this entity has to be profit-oriented. It has to separate itself from potential competitors and has to reflect our core values, which we spent quite a bit of time dis uh, discussing, and we were all completely in sync. So now in terms of the organization, uh, this, is a, this is a rocket. It's going somewhere. If you were going to the moon or Mars, which a lot of people have spoken about, who would you want to bring with you? If it was another Earth, I think you'd want to bring a farmer, you'd probably want to bring a miner, maybe an engineer. Um, who knows? You'd want to bring a doctor, you'd want to bring the right team. In building an organization, as I sh shared the other day, the core business is really decision making. And so what the proposed org, org chart here is exactly that. And the individuals involved not only represent specific skill sets, but they also represent ecosystems. And it's about finding synergies and unrealized synergies. So there'll be a board of directors, and this is what I was referring to earlier. You know, there are the phenotypes here, but they're not specific names or people at this point in time. But imagine, now I want you to sort of imagine this. So imagine a board, and imagine a board with um, a person on it uh, that may be the ex-chairman or CEO of Petco person who understands how to build businesses, understands animals. What about a person who is the CEO or chairman of a data company? What, what if a, a Larry Page joined the board? What would the company look like? You'd need a financial person on the company, on the board as well. The board, of course, over, oversees the company. You'd want a financial person on the board. You'd also want a, a lawyer or an accountant to deal with corporate governance issues. We spoke about you know, the potential of bringing on a celebrity or somebody like that to, you know, to again, add to the profile. And here, the, you know, this is Imagineering. What would happen if someone like Oprah joined the board? What impact would that have on the company? Now, all of these decisions, and again, back to decision making, is gonna have an impact on this company and the tra trajectory as each person is going to um, uh, provide a certain ecosystem. So now what we have over, over on the left, uh, as I'm seeing it here, is an advisory board and a technical advisory board. First, with the technical advisory board, what one would want to do is, is create a board of, of individuals who have expertise from a technical standpoint with respect to each of the aspects of the technology. You would also want to try and secure strategic high ground. So if, you, if there's some experts in the area, around the world, you want to bring them on board so that they're sort of off the market. And these people love to work with their peers, and so this would represent a fantastic little sandbox for those sorts of people. On the advisory board, um, what we spoke about there is, again, trying to build a critical mass in an ecosystem, and it would be individuals like Roger, for example, who's recognized as you know, one of the top whale ocean people in the world, the Jane Goodalls of the world, um, from my neck of the woods, the David Suzuki's of the world. Um, imagine back to the board of directors if the chairman or CEO of Animal Planet was on it. Um, what does the company look like? Each of these pieces change the, the dynamic significantly um, and assist in terms of creating that decision-making compass and each of these pieces are woven in. Uh, a CTO that's you know relatively you know straightforward in terms of managing the technology and uh, and and managing the protection of the technology, which we'll which we'll speak about later. Uh, the CEO, of course, is really the the cheerleader and the chief nurturer and making sure that everybody's coordinated. What will be very very critical in this business is the is the product manager. It says project, but it, it should say product manager. Uh, and that's the person that's going to be helping sort of decide what do we do. So we first start with dogs, you know, which is animal's best friend, and I invite people to Google where that, where that came from, uh, which is quite extraordinary. And if I have a minute left, I'll, I'll share that. So the product manager is going to be the person who's going to define which of the features are going to be the most important to introduce initially. And this is going to be software, so there'll be updates, et cetera. So is it going to be in the case of a dog, which will be our, our beachhead, is it when the dog has to go outside? 
or if he's hungry or if he's sick. Product manager has to take responsibility for that and make sure that whatever is built is what the market is going to want. Now the next um, piece is, is perhaps is it cats or is it guinea pigs for kids or is it whales? And so there has to be a natural sort of progression and, and there ought to be almost like math, what you're building ought to have some sort of natural um, sequence uh, to the next one, both in terms of technology and product opportunity. But the product manager is the person that manages that. Uh, the chief marketing officer, of course, creating awareness um, for this and, and alliances and, and which the business development people would do. There's all sorts of organizations that this company could be associated with, um, in, whether it's the SPCA, uh, SPCAs of the world or whatever. Um, but creating alliances and critical mass is going to be very, very important. The company is going to need money. And so, uh, of course, we have a chief financial officer also included in the organization. And raising money is, is not you know, quite as simple as the ATM and I need $400 or $200 and you get it when you need it. It really has to be plotted out. It has to be planned. So you'll look at this business over the course of a couple of years and see what the capital is going to be required to, to get through this. Um, things like how do you price this product? We had great discussions on that as well. Is it a freemium product or do you offer it at a dollar and maybe give half of it to the animal causes? You know, how do we do that? We have to be nimble and, and, and sensitive to that. Um, and, and so whatever the financial sort of uh, outlook looks like and how much capital is going to be needed is going to sort of be the basis of how much money the company is going to have to ask for. And what you would want to do is you'd want to create some milestones along the way so you don't get all the money up front, which, you know, is going to dilute the company and, and create potentially sort of an unfair balance between the people that are building it and the money. And at the same time, you have to give the money people a very fair deal because it's, you know, it's early days. And then what happens is you, as you approach a milestone and you create a value inflection, then at that point in time, you, you know, you go out with your, with your rice bowl again. And I think in this case, uh, there's an, I think there's an opportunity to access capital through foundations. Uh, this has very much a noble, charitable um, purpose mm -hmm. to it, and I think would have um, appeal to a ton of people. So there could be a lot of non-dilutive uh, capital that could go into it. So I see I've got a couple of minutes left. I'm just going to very quickly, uh, for those that don't know the story about a dog's best friend, um, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer, and this, it came from a legal case. About 150 years ago, uh, there was a, a person in the Midwest who had a dog that he absolutely loved. This is long before women had a vote, so you can imagine where dogs ranked on the food chain. And uh, his neighbor uh, one day shot the dog, and this was everything for this person. And so he sued his neighbor and went to court and uh, didn't have a lawyer and really was not certain in terms of what the outcome would be, but he was deeply, deeply hurt in terms of what had happened. And at that particular time, again with fate, there was a very, very famous case being heard. And there was one of the most famous lawyers in the country happened to be in that courtroom. And he learned about this case. And he said, listen, I'm going to help you and I'm going to represent you. He spoke to the judge. And if you Google it, people tried to transcribe. There was not a court reporter at the time. And he described how important a dog is to a person, whether it's cold outside, whether it's this, whether you're lonely, whether you have money, you don't have money, and ended up, you know, a dog is a man's best friend, which is, which is absolutely beautiful. So, uh, so I would like to now, if I can, thank you very much, everyone, um, pass the ball. And uh, next up is Gally. Thank you. Yes, there you go. Thank you. I'm just going to briefly go through the legal issues that um, we're going to need to consider. And basically, they're the same legal issues that face every startup uh, in this country. First is the form of incorporation and the state of incorporation. 
Zoolingua is already incorporated as an Arizona C Corp. Um, and as Mark said, we're going to have a charitable component. So we're going to probably want to add a benefit corporation status. And um, we're going to look at tax considerations to whether we should uh, transfer to be a Delaware company. Um, very important, of course, is the initial contracts to get agreements on paper right up front. Um, so one of the primary purposes of these contracts is going to be to get um, non-disclosures in place and assignment of IP to the company. Um, our IP is our most valuable asset, as everybody here knows, and as it gets developed, uh, becomes more and more valuable. So that will be a key component of, of every contract. So um, we're going to have contracts, of course, between the um, initial shareholders, percent ownership, um, the consideration that's given, whether it's sweat equity, cash, or assets, buyback rights, and rights of first refusal. Uh, and we're going to need these contracts with uh, our employees, our consultants, advisors, service providers like app developers and video providers. Uh, our intellectual property, I keep coming back to that because it's so central. Uh, one of the first issues that we need to look at is whether um, any of the research that's gone into this or any of the work that's already gone into this is subject to prior employ employer claims. Excuse me. Um, we don't want any prior employers to have a, a, a claim, basically, on the IP. And as we know, most of our contracts with our employers do have a provision saying that any work done on their time belongs to them. Uh, we need to trademark the name and logo, of course, and patent uh, protection is key. We need to apply as soon as, as we qualify for a provisional patent, as soon as the idea becomes uh, concrete and novel enough. Uh, and of course, again, all service providers sign an NDA and assign their IP to the company. Regulatory compliance uh, in the environment today, this can get very uh, dense and complicated. So we need to make sure that we have, um, that we've complied with local, state, and federal, all, all the business filings, employment regs, and very importantly, the securities regs um, that are so important in the initial financing issues. And uh, we, we need to have somebody looking at corporate governance issues also, uh, as we all know, very important these days. Uh, liability. There, it, there is potential liability um, with this app in terms of people relying on its, uh, its reliability in uh, tr translating animal behavior and animal vocalizations. So we're just going to have a broad liability disclaimer and release with the app download. So how are we going to pull all this together? Obviously, the company needs legal counsel. And um, basically, it comes down to whether we, we want to retain a law firm. Uh, and if so, we obviously would want one with excellent contacts and uh, very firm startup experience. Money is always an issue. A lot of these, you know, as we know, attorneys cost a lot of money. So we would be looking for a creative fee schedule, which a lot of uh, law firms would, that work with startups uh, will offer. Or do we want to bring someone in, in uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in-house um, who really knows the business inside out and knows our issues inside out? There are advantages to that, um, and you know, reach an agreement with them for equity ownership in the company. So the, thank yeah. you. Next up is Lorian. So um, I guess I wanted to begin by saying thank you for having such a terrific team. Is my mic on? Yeah. My mic? Okay, okay, good. Um, this is really AI startup in a box, right? What you're hearing from this team is relevant, you know, 90%, I would say, to many, many companies. And over my lifetime, I've been involved in um, maybe a dozen of these from a technical point of view. 
What's exciting here is the great collaboration on this team where the technical and the product and the business management are working so, um, so much in synergy. So I'm gonna take the deep dive now, um, but please don't be frightened, okay? One of the myths, the biggest myth about AI is it's really complicated to understand. And at the high level, um, AI is not hard to understand. In fact, this diagram is really 90% of what you need to know in order to start thinking about, do you want to do an AI startup and do, or either, either as your own company or within a larger organization? 90% of AI um, projects have these two phases. The first is what we might call the learning or training phase. That's where you need the big compute, you know, the graphical processing units, the cloud compute, AWS or Azure or Google Cloud. Um, and what you do during this phase is you take something called training data, you feed it through this machine learning engine, and then the machine learning engine produces what's called a model, which is an automatically produced piece of software, which is pretty cool. We don't program this. Instead, we just give it examples. In this case, the training data is just a whole bunch of dog videos, and each one of those videos is labeled with whether that dog is anxious or not. Now, we're not sure if our first MVP will be anxious or not, or frightened or not, or does the dog need to go out or not. That's one of the things that you know, we're working with the product management team to determine you know, what would be that low-hanging fruit. The key here is we're starting simple, right? We're going to market with what's called a minimum viable product, or MVP, which has lots of value, but we're not boiling the ocean. We're not taking on the world. So lots of training data, right, with examples to the computer. When you see this kind of a video, that dog's anxious. When you see this one, that dog's not anxious. We just got this column in this table of data. It's like ones or zeros. This is not hard to understand, guys. Please don't be more intimidated by AI than you need to. It's one table of data. Now, getting that data obviously has some complexities that we'll address in a minute. Feed that to the machine learning engine. That produces a model. And then our MVP, as well as many of our downstream projects, uh, products have a pretty simple um, flow. We have this video. Maybe it's a camera, like your Nest camera, that's watching you anyway for security. Maybe we partner with Nest or a company like it, and it's constantly watching video. Our model is watching that video. When the probability uh, that the dog is anxious crosses a threshold, maybe your echo says, Fido is anxious, <laughs> right? Okay, so really simple, just something that scores some new data that comes in. That's it, okay? That model, and I, I just can't emphasize more strongly, it is not hard to understand. All you need is training data, and, and honestly, the training data is where the vast majority of your intellectual property value resides in a project like this. Now, obviously, there are risks here, and over the last couple days, I've been really honored to work with a really brilliant technical team especially Dave, who, who uh, has both deep, deep dog expert, but also very deep machine learning expert. And we learned that uh, <coughs> we know like 40 people in common, but have never met um, from our AI and machine learning background. So the risks are in um, three areas, and our approach is to develop proprietary IP that addresses these categories of risks. First is with that training data, because it's a lot of training data potentially. Second, with the machine learning engine, and third, with the model. So in terms of the training data, in order to learn effectively, if we only show this thing small dogs, it's not gonna be good at recognizing anxiety or fear or whatever it is in large dogs, okay? And it's not just small versus large, there's all kinds of dimensions that differentiate one dog from another, how long their ears are, their snouts, you know, all of this stuff. So we have to have that much variety in our training data so that the system doesn't draw some you know, erroneous conclusion like all dogs with long, long tails are, are nervous or something like that. There's another dimension of complexity, which is different dogs manifest behaviors in different ways. So when I first looked at this picture, do you see that um, German Shepherd in the lower right-hand corner? I thought that was an anxious dog, right? Turns out German Shepherds do that all the time when they're not anxious, Dave told me, right? So it takes some expert knowledge, obviously more expertise than I have about German Shepherds, to know that there are some breed-dependent behavior characteristics. So if we only showed German Shepherds to our system, it would not work well on maybe Chihuahuas or some other breed that didn't elicit its anxiety behavior the same way. All of this bottom line means we need a lot of training data with a lot of diversity. So that's risk number one. How we're gonna address that is, um, and, and here we're starting to get into stuff that's specific to an image processing based machine learning company. This is still pretty generic tech. I'm not gonna disclose our proprietary secret sauce here on stage. But if you're doing an image processing company, 
you know, the traditional way, if we had all the compute in the world and, you know, 101.5 million 30-second videos in the world, we would just have a giant training data set. We'd spin up, you know, a giant AWS instance or some GPUs over on Google Cloud, and, and we'd churn away and we'd build a model. Um, since we don't have that at first, and in order to mitigate risk, we're going to take a two-tiered approach. Instead of that monolithic approach where we train everything and all of those videos, we're going to start by... Um, by doing two things. Number one, we're going to take existing images of dogs that are out there in the world, and there's millions of databases and data sets with just images of dogs. Number two, we're not going to label them. Turns out there's a technique for extracting the key features of dogs that don't require the anxiety versus the non-anxiety label. So um, what's going to determine anxiety is whether the ears are up or down, or I guess there's some micro-expressions. Um, the, the term in anxiety or licking, I think you told me, licking the nose. So these, these small things that happen that are predictors of anxiety, and we can build an initial system that just looks at still images. And then we take that system that's been, the model that's been built based on still images, we use transfer to take that, or inductive transfer, to use that to bootstrap the full system. And now instead of 1.5 million video images, our expectation is that training data, that labeled training data requirement is much sm smaller. So maybe only a few thousand videos instead of the millions. And so that reduces both our training risk as, all, as well as our labeling risk, right? Because getting humans to label the data is a complex and difficult process to get that accurate. So we're radically reducing um, the data label requirement by an order of magnitude, and then two orders of magnitude we expect to reduce by taking this two-tiered approach um, to the compute. Um, so this is kind of repeating the same thing, um, going into a little more detail. This is a very busy slide. I'm not going to read everything. But the bottom line is we're going to do that two-tiered strategy. Then another way we're going to reduce risk is with a phase deployment approach. So we're going to begin by kind of proving out our tool chain with maybe one or two images, just to get Hello World working within our platform. Number two, we'll do a proof of concept. The key technical question here is, can we really detect dog language from their vocalizations and their images? And so it's really key that before we put a lot of investment into kind of the infrastructure, that we convince ourselves very rigorously that that's possible. And, and I want to say, this is so exciting. This is the first time in history that a number of forces have converged to make this possible. And this team working with all of us, both dog experts as well as AI experts over the last week, we've realized, you know, I think several people said to me, they came in and they go, you know, I came in and this was all sort of fuzzy and I didn't know if this would really work. As we've worked through the stages and the risk mitigations, we're all pretty convinced this is not a big technical risk. It's so similar. I've probably deployed like 100 or 200 different like out in the production field AI systems over the years. This is not so different from those. Now it is new, it is bleeding edge, but its similarities are strong enough that we have good reason to think this will work if we mitigate it. And standard practice, again, is you do this really rigorous analysis of the images to make sure we can recognize anxiety before we build all this kind of infrastructure, technical infrastructure around it with, with the deployment of, of the solution. Other things we're doing is we're crowdsourcing our video submission, again, to address that video um, volume risk. And so we have uh, creative ideas like incenting dog shelters to take pictures of dogs, and then, and then Khan will train a team to, to, to do the good labels. Um, the, this is the, about the labeling risk. And again, the tiered detection means we need to label fewer images, but then we also need high quality labels. So we'll use Dr. Khan in the early phases then we'll use a multi-labeler cross-validation strategy in later phases, which means we don't just depend on one person's label. We've got to have four people agreeing that this dog is, this is an anxious dog picture before we think that it's um, you know, good to go in, in our training data. Um, and then you know, there's pretty good you know, randomized control trial, rigorous labeler training and evaluation, basically good scientific principles to be sure that the, those labels are really high quality. That dog really is anxious, right? Or that dog really does need to go out. <laughs> And, and so the quality of that data is obviously important. During inference or scoring time, so after that big compute training, the machine learning produces this model which then needs to get deployed in the field. There's another risk which is how do we make sure that thing can run fast enough? Because yeah, it's, it's embodied all the training data and kind of compressed that down, but, but that compressed representation may still be you know, a high performance time consuming approach. And so tiered modeling again will help so the same pre-processing stage we talked about before that radically reduces the dimensionality of the input data, we'll do it in this case as well. 
And then there's some new platforms coming out that do edge inference, which means they're optimized for kind of uh, low, low power environments compared to you know, big cloud GPU installations. And so we'll be evaluating those edge platforms as well. Not gonna go into this slide. My point of showing you this is not the eye chart, but to say we have these phases of the project and as we go through the phases, we get more and more images, uh, it takes more and more time and we have a higher and higher uh, breadth of data, meaning multiple dogs, multiple dog behaviors, until ultimately we do a closed beta. You guys maybe should be our closed beta initial team, right? You'll get the app, you'll get to beat on it, tell us what you like and don't like, find us some bugs, really beat it to death for a few months, and then once we think that that thing is ready for market, we'll take it into the market, again, as a minimum viable product, which will then iterate over the years, and product manage will talk about that a little more. Um, this slide doesn't say much more than that. I guess I'll draw your attention to the second row, which is really that same set of phases, where if we first get tooling, then we do the POC, then we do beta and VP. So, you know, not a lot different. We are not just building a dog app. We are building a platform for nonverbal communications with animals, and even possibly nonverbal humans we've talked about a little bit down the road, like nonverbal autistic people or, or babies. And so, Ultimately, where we're going, and this is where we really get market dominance, is we'll be a platform ecosystem application. So companies out there who might want to build a whale app or a guinea pig app or something, we'll take this tech, we'll consolidate it into a single platform which reduces their risk and cost, much like Amazon reduces the risk of launching a new Amazon um, company. And then what we do is we have this platform that then allows um, our, our platform partners to iterate through their market at a much lower cost. So it's their job to go out, you know, those guys know whales, or those guys know guinea pigs, or those guys know autistic children, and so they'll be able to anchor themselves in a lower cost platform, again, much like Amazon long tail sellers do, and then we'll have this core tech that they can then reuse, and then we make our revenues on the pull through. Um, this ultimately will create a two-sided market, right, where we have ecosystem partners which are growing in a Metcalf spiral, and this interlocks with the end users who grow. The end users love us because there's lots of different things they can do with our app. The ecosystem's partners love us because we expose them to a large market of end users. And so we will be architecting this technology in a multi-purpose enough way that it supports this very long-term roadmap where it's not just dogs, but cats and pets and whales and perhaps other kinds of nonverbal communication. Thank you very much. Next up is Greg. Testing, oh, can you, hello, hello? <laughs> hello? Yeah. You hear me okay? Yep. I'm gonna be a two-fisted speaker here right now because I've got the clicker in one hand and the, and the mic in the other. <laughs> but um, let's talk about the opportunity a little bit. Um, and probably some of this you already know. You know, most of you have neighbors, that have dogs, pets, but um, you know we did our homework. There's 60 plus million households that have at least one pet, and they're spending about $1,549, in which I can attest personally, you know, <laughs> on dog care, right? So that includes food, toys, you know, uh, routine care, boarding. Um, the category of pet spending overall is projected to grow between now and 2025 by about 5% a year, fueled a lot by millennials and concerns with health care of their pets and technology and applications. So we're definitely in a very sweet $93 billion a year total addressable market. And we're addressing a problem that, you know, uh, you know is really important to the relationship between people and animals. So that ties to you know, the brand. And, you know, some people will bury the brand, some people will think the brand is a color or, you know, a particular typeset. Um, but for this company in particular, and if you think about branding and you think about uh, the attributes of this product, it's disruption and it's dealing with deep, deep, deep people passions, right? So if you think people are in love with their computers or their cell phones, uh, think about their pets. So. These aspects of the brand are actually extremely critical to this company. The idea of caring, compassionate, empathetic, pet friendly. This third one, someone say, well, you know, what's authenticity have to do with it? But when you're thinking about reality and being authentic with some product like this, your ability to be and to seem, at, you know, the same overlap, right? 
is tied to your access to capital, it's tied to your access to expertise, it's tied to your access to buyers, to consumers. So it's advanced technology, yes, but we're still dealing with a topic that's very deep and emotional to many people, especially um, the market. Um, in terms of the marketing plan, so now we've kind of you know, established the brand, agreed, and I should call out Catherine, could you raise your hand, because you played a major role in the development of all this too. So um, establish the brand attributes and awareness, okay, as we just talked about how important that is. We want to build an engaged audience of pet owners. We obviously want to drive product sales, and as you saw from the earlier slides, the product sales are between 18 months and 24, 30, 30 months out. And then we want to look to expand uh, beyond dogs, again, as you've seen. Um, there's a lot of audiences, um, not only just dog owners and trainers and behaviorists, but daycare centers, shelter rescues, animal adoption agencies. I don't have to read the whole list, but all of these could have unique messages, unique channels and approach to market. Um, but it gives you an idea, again, of just how engaged you know, people are with their animals. Um, in terms of the key messages, the things overall we want to talk about um, as we engage with the market, um, we understand how pets express themselves. Um, the company was founded and established by Dr. Khan Slobachikov, how did, pretty close, thanks, a <laughs> leader in animal communication behavior. And then this is really the first consumer product to incorporate artificial intelligence into understanding animal behavior. In terms of strategies and tactics, okay, as we think back to that brand issue, the authenticity, um, you know, talking about the product too soon, raising expectations, not a good idea from a brand standpoint. So we really are looking to leverage Dr. Khan as an animal communication expert and thought leader. Um, we're gonna work on pricing and distribution as we get a little bit more tighter definition of the product. We're gonna repeatedly engage and grow audiences with relevant and engaging, exciting content. And we're gonna, as a very important part, and you know, Mark alluded to this, you know, embracing animal advocacy groups and concerns making contributions, percentage of profits, establishing relationships, and all that could all have synergistic effects to validating our approach and the authenticity of our brand. Um, obviously, engage press and social media, uh, strategic partnerships with IOT and pet industry companies, by IOT like you know cameras, phones, that kind of thing. Um, and we're really looking at this from a standpoint of what would be called a two-stage crescendo campaign with the first stage, the first 12 months, let's say January 2019-20, being focused primarily on company, cons expertise, and then using that to engage uh, people, the audiences. And then after about 12 months, starting to do a combination of company and product, not pre-announcing capabilities, not setting expectations that can't be met, which would violate the brand, but by talking about things that we will be addressing without, you know, advance announcing them. So we had a bunch of ideas circulating around the team for content. Um, the first I'd say, and the most obvious because of the synergy with the videos and the role that that plays with our data collection and uh, our artificial intelligence, our decision intelligence, would be short videos people would send in of their dogs, um, 30, 60 seconds to Dr. Khan to get a take on what they're saying, what the behavior is, what it's like. And using that from pet shelters, to elementary schools, to households, to like, hey, what it, what's my dog mean by this type of thing? And turning that into an ongoing blog and column featuring video, picture, kind of perspective, and then helping us to build a library, right? And then we thought about, okay, on Facebook, you know, you get people taking these tests and sharing their scores. Well, what a better idea than to have pet lovers sharing their pet empathy IQ, for example. So the, it wouldn't be like a no-brainer test. There might be things on it that people think they're being empathetic to their pets or you know, empathetic to their pets, but in fact, they're not. So we developed type of a test that people could take and then share their score on Facebook and social media. And you know, maybe we have a contest and we announce people that have high scores or something like that. And then um, in terms of uh, a series, understanding your dog's visual cues, right? Your, their top visual, visual cues. So an ongoing education 
effort to help people understand their pets as we get on our way to delivering a product. Um, you know, merch, right? So whenever you're involved with uh, people that are emotionally engaged with topics, you know, they wear t-shirts, bumper stickers, um, all kinds of things. Um, we, we create animal communication factoids, just different things that educate people that have that aha factor that are branded with Zulinga and, and Dr. Khan. All topics about social media, you know, animal welfare organizations could use them, share them, shelters could share them with people that are members of, you know, uh, pet rescue organizations could use them. And then the last kind of, you know, kind of maybe craziest idea, I don't know, um, but uh, this whole idea of uh, understanding your dog coloring book. So Dr. Khan officially endorses images of dogs behaving certain ways um, to educate children and their families about, to help them better understand the animals. So again, the theme is we're giving content out to help people bridge what we're bridging with our product. So we get a nice brand synergy with it. We help to build an audience, engage them, and get credibility. So um, I think someone else should do the close thank you slide. So. Catherine set that up. There we go. Catherine, launch it. <laughs> thank you so much. This has been an incredible experience, especially working with this team up here. Um, everybody's brought so much to this table, and that's what's brought this presentation to you today. So thank you so much, Mark, for having us. And thank you so much for everybody in the audience for listening. And uh, okay, time to be judged. Right. So uh, we have <laughs> not too much time. Uh, we have a little freedom, I think, but let's pretend we don't. Um, next step would be for our judges to ask any questions they might have, and, and then um, Probably do the questions first, and then we'll do the judging. Uh, whether whether the team met the challenge, so you heard the, the the super challenge and the three challenges, the sub challenges. That's the question. Did they achieve those those goals? And uh, see, so do you want to start, Mark? Sure. I have um, first of all two two things to start off with. One is I didn't know that if you were an expert, you could look at a dog and know what their thoughts are, you know, what, what they're trying to communicate. So first of all, that if that exists, that, that's great. And then what it seems you would be doing, that leads to my second one, is everything else seems that it can be used across a zillion things. So it'd be repeatable. All you have to do is plug in your data and the, everything else. Um, I'm pointing a camera at it. Tell me what the weather is outside or tell me what this facial expression means, or tell me, you know, is this grass healthy? I mean, that whole thing of being able to point, I would think that that would be a reusable thing that you could get more off the shelf. And what you really are focused on is a pretty narrow problem in that first, going back to my first question, does it even exist that you could identify what somebody's, what a dog is communicating, given all those other parameters about that dog, and in a repeatable manner. So the first one is, is that really fact that you can look at a cocker spaniel of this size and know what it's communicating? And then second, my second question is, is that really a repeatable, all the other stuff reusable that you could get it almost off the shelf? So uh, the answer to both your questions is yes. Uh, the, to the first question specifically, there is a lot of absolutely terrible information out there uh, for the public when it comes to dog behavior. But there is a huge body of knowledge in the scientific community, specifically in the veterinary behavior community, on how posture communicates things about behavior. It's still a lot to learn, and I, I don't want to uh, you know, make a claim that there's, uh, it's a completely solved problem. But for the kinds of use cases that we're talking about, for communicating things about stress and anxiety, excitement, happiness, um, there is a lot of knowledge about that in the, in the community, and it's things that can be operationalized in this framework, this technological framework that we talked about very effectively with the right set of experts working with the right set of data, and we have that, that plan in place. Uh, to your latter point about the reusable technology, this general architecture is, is a basically off-the-shelf IoT architecture. There's nothing uh, unique or proprietary about that. Any company that's doing anything in the IoT space has some variant of that. Uh, so yes, it'd be very reusable. I just don't know that it would be uh, super valuable beyond how we would be using it internally. So I think just uh, following up on that, um, uh, a, a couple of comments. First, uh, you know, great, great work, and uh, I can see your energy and your passion is, is quite evident. So 
Thanks for that. Um, I came into this thinking this was about like speech recognition or bark recognition, that it was a, actually verbal communication. And so the first thing for me was, oh, you're talking about nonverbal communication, and then really it's behavioral analysis, situation specific, uh, is really what this is about. Okay, so that's where it took me into a whole different place. So then to drill down on your is comment, that a question or a statement? That was that was just learning for me, okay. not, not kind of in real right. time. So that was just an awareness. But if you uh, truly understand the context, uh, you know, uh, then it, you it can more reasonably imagine being able to interpret all this data and then apply it against those contexts. So. Um, uh, have you thought about a, a short list of use cases, or I mean, of uh, specific context situations that you're looking for? Is that where you would start? Yeah, we, we actually spent a lot of time talking about that. Um, and I think for a vari variety of reasons, in the home is the um, use case that we're most interested in. Uh, I meant more of the behavioral state, I guess. Oh, yes, sorry. We've got about 10 hypotheses uh, that we have listed out that um, we know there's a lot of knowledge about already. Um, but ultimately, that's a, a consumer research question for us. What's, how should we prioritize those uh, to make sure that what we deliver is a product with ve that's very highly performant? And we don't want to try to tackle all 10 of those right. at once and give something that only works halfway. We'd yeah. rather pick a small subset and do that really, really well and then roll out updates over time. Got it. And have you thought about the timeline for for getting to the, the short list? Absolutely, yeah, it's it, first and foremost, it's one of the first things in that uh, timeline slide that Lorianne went through a little bit quickly, but that top line was all consumer research, and the first step is figuring out what should we prioritize for MVP. Right, and just remind me then, what's the, the kind of time to market? Uh, time to market is two years. Two years from now, okay, yep. got it. Plus or minus? Plus, plus or minus, but close beta in 18 months, and then, <laughs> and then public uh, in two years. Now, Khan, you've been in the team as well as sitting here, so I, I'm assuming you've already asked questions. Do you have any more questions? Yes, actually, I do have a question which I feel that Roger could address, and that is, what impact do you think this will have on the world and how people see animals and how people relate to animals? If, thanks. If you look at the market for this, you can't see it all because it simply stretches beyond the horizon. I can't think of any human being who wouldn't be interested in being able to communicate at some, some level with their animal. And also think of a moment in any of the lives of any of us here which is just horrible, and that's when your dog or your cat or whatever seems to be sick and you're not sure, and if you take it to the vet, it's gonna cost you $1,000. And so you're having to make that decision. And if eventually you could get advice which included not a diagnosis but a time to call your vet as one of the messages, I think this would have a huge uh, benefit. And then if you extend it to all the other connected uh, uh, user, users as was put up in that slide, it just goes on and on. And uh, I guess I think it would have, to me, the overall most important part of it all would be to finally connect people in a way with, wild, with animals, not wildlife, excuse me, first that are domestic and later perhaps by spillover into wildlife, but connect them in a way which has never occurred, as far as we know, in, with humanity on a large scale before. There have been you know, whisperers of this, that, or the other animal who can do amazing things. Temple Grandin fall, calls, falls to mind with horses. But they are very unusual and very rare. And we would, by the way, hope to get her. We're not sure if somebody here knows her. I can't remember. Is you? Yeah, that's right. I guess that's all I should say. I think in line with what you're saying, Roger, having been through this exact experience you're describing just recently, uh, if you knew that your dog was in pain, Exactly, and, and you need help. Yeah. And That's huge. And it, it, when, we were, when, when we came in, I wasn't aware of all the work which has been going, going on in, on dogs, and, and it's just shocking to talk to David about it for a while. I mean, you get an idea of, oh my God, had no idea this was going on. So I'm not a voter, but I'd like to ask a few questions. Uh, that one got answered already. Um, so the breed thing kind of bothered me, because I think it's true the different breeds have different profiles, and there are a lot of mutts in the world. So um, I don't know who should answer this, but is this a, isn't there a gigantic, two problems. A, the mutt problem. B, there are a lot of subbreeds and subcategories. And so 
Are you going to pick one or two? Uh, how, do you, how do you do this? Yeah, so I think um, uh, we don't have a, a, a number on it, but we have an, an idea that when we go to market, we want to have a certain amount of coverage. Let's just throw a number out there. 80% of dogs in the world, this product will work for them. The pathway to get there means starting somewhere simpler, starting with more homogeneous population in our early phases, and then building out from there. It's a, all a, so, a so standard. Wait, how, how many breeds are there? Oh, hundreds. hundreds. Uh, I don't right. know the exact That's number. Uh, I think the American Kennel Club recognizes something like 230. I, and you sound like expert on that. this. So of those hundreds, yeah. do they group into five major categories that you could deal with? They're, they're, um, uh, I wouldn't put a, that fine a number on it because there's always going to be outliers. But yes, there, are, there do tend to be groups of behavioral characteristics okay. that are common uh, that are often associated with types or fun uh, function of a dog. So herding dogs tend to have really intense stares, and retrievers love to put things in their mouth. Is, is there a potential fail point where, where all herding dogs are empathic with sheep, but they yeah. have different ways of responding to pain? Or whatever. I mean, are, are there problems? I, I don't there? think there's failure points, and in fact, I think that's a that's a benefit, right? I mean, this is that what that means is that these dogs provide uh, have consistent patterns and behavior, which is precisely what machine learning is really good at detecting. If I could just add to that, it's really critical that we do rigorous back testing so that we prove beyond a shadow of the doubt exactly how accurate we are. Right. And so, you know, we're not just going to give you some random number, you know, some p-value greater than 0.5. We're going to say, here are these thousand dogs, and we knew which ones were anxious, and they had this level of variety, and we were able to get 78% of them right. And that's going to be, you know, our very hard, easily understandable, and very rigorous back testing criteria. So I guess I'm just suggesting that there could be a matrix there that could be a fail, point of failure, because you find out that instead of hoping that there are only five things you have to build, there are 500 things you have to build. In, in terms of shared characteristics or unshared characteristics? Yeah, I, I don't consider it a big risk that we would discover a massive new set of characteristics that we didn't previously know about simply because of the domain No, I mean, I just mean that the, the, the quality of sharing between different types of dogs no. wouldn't be even. Un understood com completely. Yeah. I can say, having worked in this space for more than a decade yeah. now, I. I would put the probability of an order of magnitude misestimation of that at approximately zero. Okay. You, okay. Yeah. Um, I was curious about this, this reduction in the tagging number thing that was mm -hmm. a technical thing. Mm -hmm. You didn't really talk about that. Uh, How did you get from A to B? How did we get from How did you go from the requirement of having to do thousands or tens of down to hundreds? Or I mean, what was the technology there that got you the um, An autoencoder neural network, <laughs> which is sort of like um, you know, a feature extraction or a principal component analysis yeah. in neural network form. Yep. So in other words, we have, you know, maybe a, an image of data. Uh, so it's learning in the network. Sorry? It's learning in the network. It's learning in the network. Okay. But we ask the network, we give it a bottleneck, we say, Here, here's an image. We want you to reproduce the same image, but we want you to reproduce it by passing it through a bottleneck. Mm -hmm. And so those few hidden artificial neurons inside the middle of the network have to figure out an encoding to capture that. And in the process of figuring out that encoding, they've now compressed that massive amount of data into a much smaller set. We then take that encoding and put it in our new network, and now we can learn with fewer training examples as well as faster and higher Have you tried that before? I wrote the book on it. <laughs> Good team. Good team. <laughs> so you got to ask. I'm going to move right down this list, I think. She said what? She said Skip that question. Uh, uh, I was curious. One of the claims, it's an interesting claim, is that this is the first time that AI is being used in a dog consumer product. Um, and I thought there had been one before. Wasn't there one before? They, there's marketing around. There uh, are um, AI and uh, generally uh, and loosely defined, yeah. I mean, there's a, a large and growing pet tech uh, uh, economy, uh, largely dominated by wearables and food dispensers right now, and they all are using uh, uh, some amount of AI in them. But I would say it would, does not approach what uh, Zulingo is proposing. So you might not want to use that claim. I would say, but just advice. I mean, if you, if you come right out of the gate, you make a claim and it's wrong, That's then exactly. yeah, yeah. Well, I think they're, they're using AI for a completely different problem. Uh, There's sort of like AI yeah. whitewashing going on, like people call their stuff AI when it's all the, not. All the, all the better reason probably not to rely on that. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, I'm sure you can have a claim that's even more powerful. I just That might not be the best way to do it. Um, and you already answered this one, too. Limited vocabulary, right? You're going you're gonna to choose a limited number of things. You answered that already. OK. Are you guys ready to judge? Well, can, another question. You're uh, presentation was focused on visual cues. Are auditory cues also important? 
absolutely. Uh, but for dogs in particular, it's a very small, it's like less than 30% th uh, of their communication comes from uh, vocal cues. Uh, so the majority of information can come from that, uh, from being able to do solid image analysis. So you are using sounds as well? Yeah, we absolutely will be using sounds. Video. So the early autoencoding image analysis, obviously yeah. we don't have sounds with yeah. the images. So we'll combine that with the new video training Great. so that we get kind of the best of both worlds. Good, good. Yeah. good question. And then lastly, to, um, to actually generate revenue, is it based on the app for free, but then the corresponding ads and so forth that it would drive? I, we haven't completely decided, but I think our initial instinct is some form of freemium where you get some basic functionality and then you pay a little bit, maybe it's 99 cents a year for a little bit more, and then you know as things roll out and get more capabilities. But I, I, my gut instinct, and I, maybe I'm speaking for just myself, but I think it's the breadth of adoption that's uh, really critical with these apps and downloads so you get, you know, and more data and that kind of thing, so. We've been saying, has to pee is free. <laughs> 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 Maybe that's how we go to market. I don't know. I mean, that's important to me. I don't that's want my dog recognized. literally go to market, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was a trucking company in our town whose advertisement was, uh, you know, satisfaction guaranteed or double your garbage back. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, <laughs> yeah. so are you guys ready to make your decisions? Yeah, do you want to do it like one of judging at a time in terms of you did it like three different components, right? Are those different scores? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you want to start? So what's the first category? What do we? So let's, so we have what we have. The three tests. We've the kind of named them different ways. One yeah. is the business, right? Bus business, organizational, and okay. investing legal all together. Okay. And one is the, is the, the technical. 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 And one is the, is the marketing. Marketing, okay. So Bill, you want to start? Uh, start with the technical part. Okay. I mean, I think through the interaction, we learn more about what's possible. Um, and I think the important thing is finding the short list uh, and really understanding that and have a couple of very specific outcomes that you can then go out to market. Let's, let's give them scores of one to three. Make yeah. it easy. Three is highest or three best? Three is high? Three. Um, two. So technical? Two. Two? Yeah. But okay. you can get to three just with a little bit more. All right. And business org? Uh, pretty straightforward there. I think that my, my comment there would be in capital efficiency perspectives, uh, would you really want all those people right away, at, you know, prove the product works, and then start to add around that. So I think it would be a, the timing dimension of that wasn't really expressed. The rest of it, I think, is pretty fundamental startup 101 kinds of things there. So, so number two. is? Two. Two. OK. And then for marketing? Uh, I think this is would be a great product to market, uh, and uh, a lot of already good ideas there. So I would give that a three. Three. All right. Thank you, Mark Sunday. Uh, business organization. Um, it and seems, fundraising. Yeah, pretty straightforward, but um, didn't see anything novel, and so two. Okay. Technical. Um, yeah, I'm just intrigued by how it's a common back end with all you're really doing is changing the front end in my mind. And so I like the whole concept, something I wasn't aware of. So I'm going to give it a three. Oh, it's interesting. All right. Interesting reasoning. I like that. Yeah. Um, and then the marketing? Um, yeah, it's, uh, well, it's an exciting area. I thought some ideas that I hadn't thought of were raised, so I'll give it about a three as well. All right. Great. Uh, Khan, you are up. So how do you feel about the business? Uh, fundraising side? Um, I have to give it a three. Okay. <laughs> How do you feel about the technical side? I think three would be well for that. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Tough joke. Here, Can right? you tell he was part of the team? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, okay. All right. Marketing. Three. Oh, <laughs> I didn't even need to write that down. All right, okay. All right. So, just a minute while I add these very complicated numbers up. <laughs> Okay, not surprisingly, we have three different numbers uh, that go literally in order from Bill. So um, uh, the winner, let's see how to do this. How do we decide this? So I, we have the numbers, and I guess we'll just give a, a numeric response to you. So um, you have a seven, an eight, and a nine out of 10. Obviously, you're averaging around eight, and that's, I think that's a win. So uh, you've done a great job. Yeah, that's passing.
Actually, I said that, I said that wrong. It's not out of 10. It's out of, you know, 339. So you're even better. Yeah. Yeah. That's well a, done. That's and, a message uh, to keep I guess on going. Question, <laughs> keep yeah. on going. Yeah. So the question now is going to be, uh, the lights go out, everybody goes home, and it'll be up to all of you to talk to each other and figure out what you want to do next. Um, I've given Con a little bit of advice about that, but I'm sure uh, he'll have a lot more ideas now that he's worked with you all. <laughs> and I hope that you, uh, you find ways to help him in any ways you're comfortable with and that you do great work. And then we all will buy one. Thank Whatever you for your support, Mark, Thank as you. well. Yeah, you bet. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.